we go. It's pretty unsaid. This is uh, this comes out of conversations that we've had um, over the last couple of years. We've both been working. Uh, independently and now together on horse equipment of the 11th century, hence the veritable sticker album of logos at the bottom. Um, and we'd like to present to you our, our latest thinking in terms of placing this equipment, not just in geographical spaces, but also in, in social and cultural ones too. We'd like to start with a person. Herod the Wake was famed for having led a rebellion against the new Norman rulers of England in 1071 from his final base on the island of Ely. But what's more of interest for the purposes of today's presentation is that he spent most of his adult life exiled in Flanders. In Herod the Wake, we have an in English mercenary fighting in Zealand in the employ of the Count of Flanders, demonstrating both the emergence of a riding group at the time and the mobility of this low-ranking elite across the North Sea in the mid-11th century. So as I mentioned, this paper aims to provide an up-to-date synthesis of metalwork evidence for equestrianism in the long 11th century, taking an international approach. We're going to explore the various supranational connections and differences we can see in the surviving components um, of equestrian equipment, and then move on to attempt to assess the relative social standing of equestrianism in our case study areas. It's hoped that by taking a wide view of horse ownership and use in the 11th century, that a more nuanced sense of its cultural, political and social function can be provided for a given country or region. We, of course, are not the first to consider metal equestrian equipment of the 11th century or to draw evidence from across international borders together. But what's remarkable about the historiography <coughs> of this material is that even 30 years ago, the corpus was still being defined, with the identification of relevant material developing as late as the last decade of the 20th century, or indeed the first decade of this one. And our advances in knowledge are primarily due to an, a large new data set provided by non-ferrous metalwork lost in the historic landscape and recovered in the modern day through metal detecting. So very briefly, what we now can identify our stirrup strap mounts, these objects here, which protected a stirrup strap at the point at which it travelled to the apex loop of an iron stirrup. These had mostly been thought to be box or book mounts. Stirrup terminals located at the junction of the tread plate and arms of a stirrup, either as part of a composite construction or to strengthen that point and a variety of cheap pieces and bridles, my arm's not long enough, but up there, um, which can be connected formally by aspects like these three knots to other strap links which would have been located on various parts of the horse's harnesses. Following a short synth synth synthesis of this material by James Graham Campbell, which didn't include stirrup strap mounts, they had not quite been identified at the point where he was writing, it was the late David Williams in England who has advanced our knowledge of these fittings. In fact, this picture alludes to, to David. Um, he identified stirrup terminals in the 1990s and provided schemes of classification for the rest of the material by the early 2000s. In Denmark, Anne Pedersen applied some of these classifications to the Danish material in the late 1990s. Any subsequent work has, built on, has been built on that by Williams in England and Pedersen in Denmark. But the most recent developments, which we're currently digesting, have come from other parts of Europe, as schemes for the recording of metal-detected material have been developed. So in Denmark itself, we have the DEMA database launched to the public um, quite recently, which will continue to expand the Danish corpus of fines. And uh, what we're considering, particularly at the moment, are the increased fines in the Low Countries, through Madeira, in Flanders, and the Portable Antiquities of the Netherlands. But while this North Sea Zone is becoming far better documented through such schemes, there remains a dearth of publication from the interior of the continent with which to compare the corpus. 
So much of this earlier work was, was primarily focused on the identification of this material rather than by examining its, its spread. And although David Williams did publish continental material in his book on Stuart Stratmounts in the late 90s, it wasn't his aim to chart the international spread of it, uh, let alone as uh, assemble a complete European data set. And subsequent writers, Anne Pedersen, Elsie Rosedahl in Denmark, Norbert Gussler in Germany, they compare their national data sets with those from overseas, but nobody's tried to provide an overall distribution map. Well, until now, we have. Um, the map that we've generated for this presentation reflects both our current sense of the extent of use of mostly non-ferrous equestrian accoutrements. It also reflects the historiography of their study, um, a, a reflection itself to the, on the extent to which metal-detected finds have been recorded historically. To what extent is this group of material homogenous? Now, we don't, we don't have time to go into a highly detailed analysis of the similarities and differences, but we'd like to provide a couple of examples. So, Stuart Stratmounts, David Williams divided into three main types, two of which primarily, the triangular class A at the top and the trapezoidal class B at the bottom, are often the latter with openwork decoration and an angle on the flange uh, where it was attached to the strap. At this very general level, we can see that although stirrup strap mounts of class B are spread throughout the whole of our study area, um, those of class A seem to operate across an Anglo-Scandinavian axis and, put rather crudely, are absent on current evidence in the Low Countries. Delving slightly deeper, discrepancies can be noted within the types and subtypes of class B. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide of this. Um, if you start comparing those from the coast to, uh, to those from the interior, those from the interior look rather different. They're of different form, pentagonal form, rather than the trapezoidal form, which have a lot more similarities with material from East Anglia over in England. And to cite the cheek pieces briefly, there are distinctions there to be drawn between the distribution of Williams Type 1, which is another Anglo-Scandinavian distribution, and those of his type 3, which seem to follow the class B strap mounts being found both in England, Eastern England, and the Low Countries. But approaching these questions of similarity and difference through typology can only take us so far, so I'd like to move on to art style. The dominant art style displayed on this equipment, um, do, sorry, dominant art styles are the late Viking Age art styles of Ringerica on the left, and Ernest on the right. Uh, these dominate the corpus common to England and Scandinavia, as might be expected, and many have been argued to originate in England, such as the, the so-called English Ernest style strap mounts on the top. So the dominant style that we can apply to this equipment is Anglo-Scandinavian. But on the other hand, we can't apply it to every single example. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the, 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 the Romanesque example on the left. Michael's already discussed those, um, and that suggests a, a relatively late date for them. Um, rather, we'll return to this trend identified for um, variety in the distribution that we saw in the typological analysis. It seems apparent uh, in the material emerging from the Netherlands, exemplified by uh, examples on the right here, considered recently by Vessel Spelder, that even though cheek pieces might be characterised as being of Williams type 3, that the types in the Low Countries occupy a stylistic spectrum of animal art, one end of which can no longer be called Anglo-Scandinavian. So in the time remaining, we'd like to have a look at the cultural implications uh, of the commonality of 11th century equestrian accessories in the North Sea world, but briefly to touch upon another question raised by this, uh, this, the, the sheer quantity of the, the material that we're now documenting, what was the social status of the riders who were using it? So when Graham Campbell presented his synthesis of these 11th century objects in the early 1990s, he was discussing a corpus numbering in the tens, 
And he was therefore talking in terms of the growth in use of horses by a military elite. But then when David Williams started gathering his stirrup strap mounts, he amassed over 500 of them. And we've had many more hundreds gathered through the PAS in the years since. And we've been forced to reconsider the social status of those who possessed and displayed such objects. Anne Pedersen has commented on the relatively low quality of manufacture of particular examples. And they are generally, although they're well moulded, they're generally under embellished. There's no niello, there's no gilding. Perhaps there doesn't need to be. These are brass, they'd be shiny anyway, but there's no gilding, or at least very little on these things. So that suggests that these relatively low value coprolo accessories were not necessarily used by the highest echelons of society. Moving from the nature of the objects to where they're found, we come up against uh, the issue that most were lost in transit in the rural landscape and recovered by metal detecting rather than by excavation. Uh, my PhD data set of these um, has 95% decontextualised rural finds, leaving very few opportunities to explore contextual association. That said, Looking at the, some of the detected finds in detail from a particular place, particular parish, we can make some suggestions. So one example is Romney and Kent. We know from the Doomsday Survey, it's 1086 in England, that that was a large village with 14 freemen, and that has yielded eight of these syrup strap mounts. In coastal Flanders, this equipment is associated with larger detector find concentrations. Site contexts where we have them are rather mixed, with examples of such material occurring in deserted medieval settlements and castles alike. In modern day Belgium, though, we have a stirrup strap mount as yet unpublished from the late 10th to early 11th century castle of Enama in East Flanders. This high status association in the continental interior might suggest that this material has slightly different social connotations across its geographical spread. Now, work in progress, these connotations need to be teased out as more material is recorded in those places where recording schemes for detector finds grows into maturity. But in the areas where we have a lot of material already, it seems clear now that these horse riders can no longer be thought to be the high elite. It may therefore be that such material was used by range encompassing the lower aristocracy and peasants who were free, but who had military obligations. So very briefly, we, we have a lot of this material now. We have a lot of it decorated in an Anglo-Scandinavian style. What are the cultural implications of this? Could it simply represent a fashion for a military look, resulting from the Anglo-Danish military power in the early to mid-11th century? Remember that in the 9th century, we saw Carolingian sword belts permeating dress accessories uh, to give that same sort of military, military appearance. We're obviously working in a similar geographic space. Are we seeing a similar cult social cultural network operating around the North Sea in the 11th century? Does it provide evidence of interactions between a lower horse riding aristocracy, given the spread of this material across Northwest Europe? but more, also more particular patterning within the zone. And here we come back to Herod the Wake, an individual we know fought on both sides of the North Sea. We have argued that this material can be socially situated at and around this level. And in support of this, there was an apparent lack of high status prototypes for such adornments. Putting these together, is there something more culturally explicit in the adoption of a more or less distinctively Anglo-Scandinavian material culture? Can it be seen as a statement of political alignment with the Anglo-Danish kingdom? And of course, this is a particularly interesting uh, question in, in the case of the Low Countries. There seems to be a trend towards material found in the coastal zone of the Low Countries, mirroring that in Eastern England, as I mentioned and by extension looking towards the Anglo-Danish Empire in parallel to political contact between the court of Pinut and the Count of Flanders. By contrast, stirrup strap mounts of the Etonian interior were of different designs and different forms, with very few parallels at all in England. 
However, as more material is coming to light through Pan and Medea, it seems that this patterning is not so clear-cut, with a greater spread of typologically similar cheek pieces inland. So what we're going to have to do before we come back to you again is uh, potentially do a more detailed stylistic analysis of each region to distinguish the material that might legitimately be described as Anglo-Scandinavian, or alluding to it at least, to, divide, to define this zone of influence. To sum up, now we can place large quantities of non-ferrous equestrian adornments in the 11th century, which were barely known even 30 years ago, let alone their significance appreciated. Thanks primarily to those who have worked with metal-detected material, first individuals, now regional and national schemes, we can now move beyond problems of identification to reconsider and place the social significance of such material and analyse and place its cultural implications within a truly international context. And thank you for your attention.